Okay, good afternoon, ladies and uh, uh, gentlemen. A uh, pleasure to receive you. Given the composition of it, uh, I will. Uh, do I have to speak English? Yes. I prefer. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> just thinking about it, come on. You, you come from Belgium, uh, uh, which is, uh, how to say, former Austria, Netherlands. You should speak German, okay, but you don't. Okay. Okay, okay. And how many only French speakers are here? Now, I'm just thinking because uh, part of my opening it I wanted to do in French, but uh, it's not the case now, so I will only do it in English with some words of German. Uh, welcome, welcome, bienvenue. It's a pleasure to welcome you here. Originally, also my mistake was I thought I can welcome you in the newly renovated Kassensaal, which is not the case, sir. And given the size which I hear, I had to say, I think it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I welcome most importantly, the other uh, 65 uh, 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 people that have inscribed. I'm sure they will be on the other side of the, of the electronic connection. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope some of you would show up here but it's not the case. Uh, and just before we were wondering whether the no show up has to do that no food and wine was initiated in the, in the invitation. Uh, I would like to know it because it would then help and make us our future invitations easier to find out how to say whether we are attractive with or without food. Uh, I, there are three things why I wanted to do this uh, opening myself. Number one is that I do usually all the openings here at the Central Bank because I think the Central Bank is a specific place, not only in Europe but worldwide. It's a center of knowledge, knowledge management, and it's a place, how to say, where you find interesting people, uh, where people come together and uh, to talk and to learn. A second reason, of course, is that uh, I have been a declared liberal my whole life through, and when one talks about neoliberalism, I would like, how to say, to be part and parcel of the discussion, and uh, that's the reason why I'm here. And the third part is, has to do that uh, uh, I'm an economist who worked uh, for more than half of his life uh, in uh, and four institutions of multilateralism, be it the OECD, be it the IMF, uh, be it the World Bank, but I worked also for other institutions, the form of consulting, including the ILO and many other institutions. And I think uh, part of the discussion we're having later on is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, also linked with multilateralism. I originally envisaged to present uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the panel here, uh, including those who are here and those who are away, and I think I will still do it at the opening is there. Uh, it is, uh, if I understand, uh, Natasha Weyer, she is uh, uh, coming in from afar. I hope you can see and hear as well. And uh, bonjour et bienvenue ici dans la salle électroniquement. Uh, we have uh, Maria Holzner, well-known executive director of the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. We have, and we just found it out, my old uh, friend and colleague, Lajos Bokros, whom we have seen for 20 years or so, last time when he gave his farewell at the World Bank. That's great to see him. He's now professor at the Central European University. And uh, uh, Karel Lano, who is also, in the meantime, a, a very good acquaintance and friend uh, because we meet off and on in Belgium in different uh, circumstances, including in the past uh, invitations uh, with the Austrian ambassador there for interesting discussions about uh, uh, the uh, Commission, Europe and the world. In my opening remarks, I would like to make three points. The first, a little bit on the definition of liberalism, because neoliberalism, because there is some kind of a 
uh, antagonism uh, between uh, some of the definitions historically, which I will highlight a little bit. Uh, the second part has to do uh, using uh, uh, the differences between the US and Europe in economic development uh, and the question, how is it uh, emerging and uh, what are the links to what are uh, uh, some proposals by, uh, how to say, neoliberalism includes. And the last one is taking up the point, I think, which is a, a, a critical one, is uh, uh, with regards to the multilateralism and how the current development of naturalism can be, how to say, linked uh, with uh, uh, what we work on in our economic uh, sphere and what the outlook is. Let me start with the first one. Uh, the first one deals with the question of uh, neoliberalism and where it's coming from. And uh, the notion has been used often on that way, often in the past, and the first time it was, how to say, uh, proposed not only as a notion but also clearly defined happened in 1938. And before I continue to say, I throw on my knowledge, not only my subjective knowledge, I use uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, with the big here and the neoliberalism and this uh, definition, how to say, which uh, uh, otherwise would find a lot of opposition if it were not uh, broadly correct. So in 1938, at the colloquium of Walter Lippmann, for those who worked on liberalism will have heard the name before, a German economist at this time, uh, the term uh, neoliberalism was proposed, among other terms, and ultimately chosen to be used to describe a certain set of economic beliefs. And uh, the colloquium defined the concept of neoliberalism as the priority of the price mechanism, free enterprise, the system of competition, and the strong and impartial state. And to this later on the number of uh, 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 um, other interventions were, addressed, uh, were added to address uh, weaknesses of uh, uh, modern economic policy. And uh, the neoliberal state interventions brought, of course, clashes uh, with the opposing laissez fair camper of classical liberals like uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises and uh, most scholars in the 1950s and 1960 understood neoliberalism as referring to the social market economy and its principal economic theories like Walter Eucken and Wilhelm Röpke uh, 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 have used it and uh, the term neoliberalism is rarely, if ever, used by proponents of free market policies. So this is one part of it. Now, nowadays, uh, this notion is used uh, quite differently in many, but not in all, communications. And uh, according to Wikipedia, this has to do that uh, in Chile, during the military rule under Augusto Pinochet, 73, 1990s, as we all know, Opposition scholars took up the expression to describe the economic reforms implemented there and by the proponents, as we know, the Chicago boys. Uh, once uh, this new meaning was established among the Spanish-speaking scholars, it diffused into the English language studies of political economy. And according to a study quoted also in the uh, Google uh, in Scholar, in, 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 uh, uh, in Wikipedia, uh, neoliberalism in this 148 scholarly articles, neoliberalism is almost never defined. And it has uh, to be used nowadays as a term of abuse and or imply less a fair market fundamentalism, virtually identical to classical liberalism rather than as it was used in the 1930s to the 1970s. So. 
This is something to put on the table because it's something which has uh, uh, always astonished me how this difference can emerge there. And uh, for what I say now is, of course, very clear that I, how to say, I relate personally very much to the uh, uh, prior definition up to the 1970s has also to do that at this time I did my studies. So I was educated at this time. And uh, this is also which was used uh, later on uh, under the Washington Plus consensus. So the, uh, the, the, the things what one should do, not do, but added uh, with a number of social uh, and uh, political and economic intervention. That's the first part. The second part then is, okay, uh, if we go back now to an ongoing discussion which emerged very strongly in the recent weeks, uh, and I saw it very strongly at, during the spring meeting uh, in uh, Washington, but also before talking uh, to market and other players in New York, the question emerged, uh, what makes the difference between the US and uh, Europe, if you look into the GDP uh, uh, per capita, why is the US uh, growth-wise or level-wise so much progressing? And out of this discussion, five uh, explanations emerged, uh, which have non, not been refuted in our interaction, and this included uh, uh, chief economist of IMF of central and other central uh, uh, banks, as well as uh, uh, as many of my uh, colleagues from research there and others. Number one is, it is the extraordinary budgetary policy of uh, the US with a deficit of glorious seven plus percent. Of course, such a uh, uh, fiscal stance is quite likely not sustainable and as a result of it, how to say, one can note this one, but uh, one asks the question how to say whether this is not being overdone and as a neoliberal say, okay, this is not sustainable. The second part has to do with the much higher productivity growth and economic dynamism which exists in the United States compared to Europe. Now the question is what are the kind of things you can immediately pinpoint this one to something which is easy to understand. Well, simply put, uh, the US has much more schumpeter than what we have in the sense of, uh, of uh, 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 allowing uh, enterprises to demise and uh, uh, employers uh, to quit and change their way of work. Whereas in Europe, how to say, the time of the COVID crisis was used to foster a number of dispositions for a long time. The third part has to do that uh, the US uh, has profited uh, from a very strong labor supply in the US coming from the outside. The outside uh, is uh, migrants and migrants US mean essentially only economic migrants because if people, uh, individuals come to the US uh, and expect social benefits, it doesn't happen. Uh, and uh, whereas in Europe, it's the opposite and uh, where you have a lot of uh, public expenditures. The fourth part of it, uh, this is something which uh, I tested out and uh, people could not refuse it, but it's never mentioned otherwise in the policy discussion is to do that. We had in the last uh, 10 years major terms of trade shock. Europe highly negative, the US highly positive. But nobody so far has measured the size of this trade shock. In a prior work I had asked uh, my economic team to measure what it means for Austria, so the negative shock and we came out only for two years uh, to about uh, minus 4% of GDP, and perhaps the trade shocks, and they asked the IMF uh, chief economist to look into that, to some estimate, which is technically not so easy. Perhaps all of this 8-9% of difference since the 1919 uh, may be to, to this one. 
And the last part, uh, which I like to mention a lot before, is that uh, the U.S. Sir, uh, has a much more dynamic and functioning capital market, and uh, with uh, deep pocket pension funds and uh, real capitalists, which in Europe we typically we don't have. So all of this is a major is a major difference. And the question is now, how does neoliberalism, how would it change now, in what direction, uh, 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 if you were to move it, giving it up or to strengthen it, uh, the, uh, the difference between the US and Europe. And only we come with the last part before I hand over to Mr. Wiese, who is already waiting that he can take over uh, the discussion, is uh, uh, the question of uh, uh, the global south and the global north. Because uh, what we currently have is that uh, whatever the differences between uh, uh, US, Europe, and the other parts of the global north, uh, uh, this won't be the dividing line over the next couple of years. Uh, and and uh, the question is uh, what it will be is tightly linked to the question of multilateralism, understood as uh, the working of international institutions like uh, WTO, IMF, World Bank, uh, ILO, and others. Uh, and how these institutions will work in the future. And this will depend on something which will be decided over the next couple of years, but the discussion has not yet started. The discussion is at technical level, but ultimately it will have to be lifted at political level. And this has to do with the representation of the global south and the global north and institutions which we need to change. And I use the best exa the ex example in your best, which is the IMF. As you know, we had recently an increase in the quotas, 50%, in order to allow uh, to catch up with the need uh, to have financing ready for countries, not to rely on uh, agreements to avoid other things. But this was equiproportionate, so everybody had the same share, so uh, the relative shares remained the same. But this was done under the clear understanding that over the next two or three years there will be a change in the quotas to the benefit of members of the Global South, China, Indonesia, Brazil, etc. Now how can this change take place? Well, if countries that are overrepresented lose them out. And it's not countries, it's a whole country which is overrepresented, which is Europe because uh, we have uh, a German chair, a single one, we have a French one, we have an Italian one, we have an UK one, and then we have the Netherlands uh, together with Belgium uh, plus other countries, and then we have uh, uh, Switzerland with Poland and other countries, then you have Turkey, Austria and other countries. So and this compares with two chairs, soon three chairs for Africa. Okay, we lose shares there. But the big question is, what is the uh, commitment of the Global South to multilateralism? What is their interest in making it work? And here there's something which I learned in New York. I also had meetings with the Austrian ambassador to the United Nations. And there it came much clearer out than I heard it uh, in Washington is the request from the Global South to the Global North, you own us, for whatever reason what it is, you own us. Well, if such a claim is out there, this doesn't bode well with regards to multilateralism. So if and as we move there, we will have problems. And of course, this begs the question then, what does it mean for neoliberalism? It can, can, how can it help? in order to make things work better. So, with these three topics, which I took to the table based on my uh, recent and much longer term uh, uh, consideration, I hand over to you, uh, Thomas, for your leadership, and I will think careful to your discussion. Thank you very much, thank you.
So thank, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for this um, uh, well thought through uh, and detailed, uh, let's say, introductory lecture, as it, as, as it were. Um, so I, I will uh, just make a few, uh, few remarks. Uh, if we, uh, as, as you said, uh, the term neoliberalism uh, has been more or less conflated also uh, with the term Washington Consensus, i.e. liberalized trade accounts, privatization, uh, uh, no barriers to entry, uh, no barriers to inward uh, foreign direct uh, investment, uh, and, and the like. And uh, over, the, over the last years and uh, one, or, one or two decades, uh, life has changed for uh, many countries. Uh, we saw uh, the entry of China into the uh, WTO, and increasingly now uh, we can now see Natasha, which is very good. Hi, Natasha. Um, and so we have major players uh, who uh, were not playing along uh, the rules of the game. China uh, with a uh, different system uh, of state intervention uh, than would be compatible, uh, one, must, uh, one must say, uh, with uh, what, what we have as uh, an open, multilateral, competition-based, price mechanism-based uh, uh, system. We have the United States, which historically uh, were uh, loath uh, to be subject to the rigors uh, of uh, institutions such as the WTO, et cetera. And increasingly, uh, if we look at policy initiatives uh, of the US, uh, the playing field, which was never quite level, uh, has been tilted in so many directions that it begs the question of where, where does that uh, leave Europe? Institutions were designed uh, for uh, common rules and more or less uh, level playing fields. Uh, we have uh, seen these significant divides uh, in uh, the global trading system. Uh, we recognize, on the other hand, of course, the necessity uh, for uh, increased state intervention for such things as uh, uh, the, the uh, green, greening our uh, economies. But where does that leave us? Where does that leave us with the institutions uh, that should regulate what the globe does in terms, uh, for example, of trade, just to mention uh, one, uh, one issue? And uh, are we now uh, going to see a drifting apart uh, of sectors, segments uh, of, the, of the world economy? Uh, what you alluded to uh, in, the, in the IMF uh, may uh, work out or not, but that is a necessary but not sufficient uh, uh, condition. Um, where does that leave uh, Europe? If th there are rules that only one part uh, of the global uh, uh, economy uh, adheres to, what does that mean uh, for uh, institutions? Will we have two sets of institutions? Will we have two sets of rules? Will we have no set of rules which people uh, are uh, respecting, i.e., what is so? If depending on uh, what uh, colleagues here uh, with us today see as the future uh, of a rules-based system, where does that leave Europe? Uh, how shall we organize our relations uh, with other with those other parts uh, of the world economy? And uh, therefore, the three central questions are, is indeed liberalism uh, uh, widely understood trending downwards, or is this just a historic blip? Uh, if it is uh, trending uh, downwards, what are the ramifications? What, what's the significance for global uh, economic governance? And thirdly, where does that leave Europe? What should we be doing? Um, and not only what should we be doing in 24 and 25, but what uh, role uh, should Europe be playing uh, in this whole uh, system? Now, uh, maybe uh, as, as a sequence, I have a certain presumption of what uh, colleagues will be 
uh, which approach colleagues will be taking. Uh, I would ask first, uh, Lajos, if you could uh, kick off. Uh, then I would turn to Natasha, then to Karel, and then to uh, Mario uh, with around five minutes uh, each. Then I would ask you uh, to comment on uh, what uh, other colleagues here have said, and then we will open it up uh, for a uh, discussion, which I am sure, even though not too many people are here in persona, uh, will be a lively one. Over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah. Distinguished Governor, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and privilege to be here in the nice building of the Austrian National Bank. I was here many times before uh, under very different circumstances. And I enjoyed tremendously your introductory remarks because it uh, offered a very interesting new approach to frame the problems, <clears throat> what we are facing now and um, since we have only five minutes, and uh, I want to be very disciplined, um, let me just add a few things to what has already been discussed. <clears throat> One is that um, uh, to speak about global north and global south is, uh, of course, justifiable. But uh, there is another interesting uh, cleavage in uh, world uh, politics and world economic policy and world uh, history, I would say, uh, which can be characterized by the ever increasing and intensifying struggle between the Western civilization and what we can call the less democratic, less liberal China and Russia-led alternative civilization, which is offering itself uh, as a role model for many countries in the global south. So it is much more than just multilateralism. It's uh, the question of the further strengthening or the new disintegration of globalization. That's, uh, for me, one of the most important challenges, and I would frame the European answer uh, in that context. <clears throat> uh, we have this uh, nice uh, <clears throat> uh, dividing line within the European Union as well. You have a few countries, unfortunately one is mine, which uh, tries to get closer to the Chinese-Russian model of uh, let me put it mildly and politely, state interventionism, which is exactly the opposite of liberalization, the opposite of privatization, the opposite of free market, the opposite of uh, free, free price formation, and for me, one of the most important uh, characteristic feature of this model is, again, the line between the public sphere and the private sphere of economic and social and cultural life is getting blurred, which is, again, diametrically opposed to liberalism, neoliberalism, both. <clears throat> um, I think the European Union uh, has many, many challenges. Um, and on the one hand, I would love to see uh, the incorporation of a few more countries rather soon, despite the fact that there are quite a few discussions and different uh, Weltanschauung even within. <clears throat> that can inject uh, fresh blood to the European Union and uh, expose it to new challenges, new questions, and uh, as a consequence, we have to reformulate many of those uh, institutional solutions, what we have right now, in order to make, by the way, our economy uh, more competitive. Because 
in a sense what uh, the distinguished governor uh, described in case of the US versus Europe uh, uh, dichotomy is that in, in, in many areas uh, we are losing uh, competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the American, North American sphere as well. I would include also Canada and Mexico to a certain extent. And that's not good because the strength of the Western civilization as such does matter. There should be no big difference between the North American and the European side in this respect. And um, finally, um, as an economist coming from <clears throat> a former communist country, I, I always uh, uh, remind uh, my audiences that um, our transition is uh, far from over. So many of these countries, uh, unfortunately, reversed the trends toward uh, institution building in a liberal market economy. And as a consequence, like Hungary, went back to state interventionism, uh, which is uh, a, a great drag on economic growth uh, and will harm uh, the whole European Union, by the way, not only just the countries in, in question. So um, these are some of the new additional challenges which uh, I would love to put on the table. And then uh, ob obviously I have my own views, but I reserve it for a later stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Natasha. Thank you very much, Thomas. I, I hope you hear me well and see me at least uh, well enough so that you can understand what I say, despite my strong French accent. Um, it, I, I, I apologize for not being in, in, in Vienna today. I accepted that uh, panel because it was an opportunity to come to Vienna and things are, are, are like this. Uh, I would have loved to be back at the UNB. Uh, back in, v, in, 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 v, in Vienna uh, to see friends and, and also family, but I'll be there virtually. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer your, your question uh, with uh, three or four points uh, in five minutes. That should be enough. Uh, and that comes at a time where we swim in a sea of reports amidst the, you know, in the context of the European election. Uh, coming up, uh, there's one report by my former boss, Christian Noyer, on Capital Markets Union. There's another report by my other former boss, uh, Mario Draghi, on, on, on Europe. And, 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 and the third report by uh, my former colleague here at Sciences Po, Enrico Letta. And they all have a lot of uh, wise thoughts about what could bring the European Union up to uh, the current state of the world. And the current state of the world is and I speak as an economist here, modestly, is one where the tectonics of geopolitics are shaking everything, everything uh, which is, you know, has to do with economics, with society, with politics, and with the international monetary order. So having said that, my, my first point will be, in the European context, we now have a setup where a number of things have been built, a number of policies have been set up, and we might see a triangle of incompatibility. I won't explain it too long, but just to say three elements that um, need to be uh, made compatible. Um, one is the ability to deal with the long-term challenges of climate. Um, the other one is this idea of having some degree of strategic autonomy, sovereignty. And the third one is competitiveness. And here, uh, there's no single answer to, to the bilateral, you know, compatibility of the, those three elements. But uh, on, the, on, the, on the potential, you know, tension between financing uh, the green transition and European competitiveness, uh, we've put out a report with the National Productivity Board in France, which brought us a lot of trouble with the French authorities. Uh, because we concluded that the measures that France has been pushing in terms of, you know, CBA uh, border tax uh, and, and, and the, you know, trading system, the carbon trading system, uh, they come at a cost in terms of competitiveness. They hated that, but in a sense, there was no uh, negation of that fact. On the relationship between 
financing the transition and strategic autonomy, sovereignty, and reindustrialization of Europe. Here, the things are perhaps a bit more positive, or we can be a bit more optimistic. We, we still miss the measurement uh, tools, and there's here a positioning of Europe in terms of extra financial accounting that could be a leap forward. If we're able to measure all those externalities that we are dealing with um, we, with the, the, the transition, then, uh, then we can make those things profitable that are not profitable from today's perspective. Just to give you an anecdote, we just gave a price uh, at Sciences Po yesterday to a startup, which, and, and, and this is a formal central banker speaking now, uh, a, a startup that is tokenizing um, the externalities from 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 anything that you know reduces carbon, that produces uh, helps biodiversity, all those things that are not in financial accounts. I should hate it as a central banker because you know what uh, tokenization and bitcoins mean. But as a principle, giving value to those things that don't have value is, is something where Europe can can be heading forward. And when I say value, I don't not only mean financial value, but also civilizational value. That was my first point. Second point is, is linking this idea of having an industrial policy uh, to the commensurability of what is happening elsewhere in the world. And here we have the IRA in the US and, and China. That was already mentioned, so I won't you know, expand on that point, but I think this point is related to the first. My third uh, point has to do with those this tectonic of geopolitics, and 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 I'm speaking out of Sciences Po, where we are, where we've had to deal with a number of you know troubles, like many other universities in the world, um, related to those issues. And here, this is much more difficult. That was Lars was 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 mentioning this, and and her governor was mentioning this as well. We are dealing with things that are much more complex, right? Uh, the promotion of democratic values, a lot of elements and we hear a lot of discussions today from people you wouldn't have heard, thought you would hear those arguments about you know the pros and cons of almost democracy questions about human rights are also on the table that's a bit of an effort the question which is a sort of consequence of those two elements of conflict resolution is the key one, I think, and it's closely related to liberalism and neoliberalism. Here, let me explain what I mean by this. The resolution of conflict is, there are many philosophies on this, and I'm way no expert on this to be expanding too much, but what I know, and that's probably maybe a French angle, is that you have these three Ds uh, approach to uh, resolving conflicts, and the three Ds are diplomacy, uh, defense and development. And we don't see that much of a successful diplomacy at the moment. We see a lot of thought about, uh, you know, talk about defense, but things are very uncertain at the European level. On defense, I would just give one illustration, and then I stop, Thomas, because I know I'm, I'm over time already, but I, I close on this, and my fourth point will be for the, for, for, for the next round. But um, on defense, we invited a, a week ago, or 10 days ago, the Prime Minister of Estonia, uh, Kaya Kalas, whom some of you may, may know, and she gave a, a, a wonderful lecture for one hour almost. There was one single thing defense, defense, defense. We did not expect it that way, with very strong messages in a way that for us, French, was really unusual to hear. So I think we have these different historical, you know, lineages that are now coinciding with a very, you know, contemporary uh, element of conflict with which we have to deal together and for which a lot of people around the EU table, not to mention the EMU table, but the EU table, are hoping for tools and for solidarity on one way to, to, to deal with this. The third one is development and development funding and multilateral institutions. I keep that for the next uh, the, uh, sort of round uh, together with the, with the, with the, the, the you know, uh, the dominant currency paradigms that are related to neoliberalism. Thank you. Thanks very much, Natasha. Karel. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here, Thomas. Uh, Governor, interesting discussion, but which can uh, lead us very far. Let me make rapidly three points. Uh, one on what is liberalism. Of course, you raised it already. Then secondly, on uh, the international economic order. And then thirdly, to say something on developments in Brussels. First of all, on liberalism, I mean, there's a, a book which I read uh, two years ago by a philosopher, which is called Anneline de Dane. She's teaching in Utrecht about the history of freedom. And the nice thing about the book, if you see, she basically reflected on how is the concept of freedom reflected in constitutions, say through history, but also in constitutions through the 19th and 20th century in Europe. And basically you see enormous differences in, above all, let's say you can polarize between a US system where you have to protect the individual against the state and the more European thing where you have variations in Europe, where it's basically protecting the European, I mean, the individual with the state. And that is so fundamentally different, for example, which we saw when I was in the US during COVID, probably you may remember, the Americans were totally worried about having a system like we had in Europe. You had a pass, uh, a digital pass, let's say, to monitor, let's say, uh, whether you were vaccinated in COVID. The Americans just refused to have this because they refused to have a state which could control what they were doing. And when I was there, let's say, during, at the end of COVID, let's say about two years ago, they had this, whatever, sheet of paper, but they refused to have what we had in Europe, this digital pass, which we all thought in Europe, let's say, was very easy. But even in Europe, let's say, we have differences between, for example, the French constitution, which is more of the system of, let's say, a state which protects the individual, uh, where, and whereas in Germany, it's already more going towards an American model where you have the individual, which uh, sometimes must be protected against the state, which is also related to uh, the German history. But just keep this into perspective. Let's say there are many different translations of freedom in constitutions, and which also then influences, of course, this dis discussion about neoliberalism. Secondly, about the international economic order and multilateralism, I just wonder, I mean, if I see what's going on in the world around us, certainly um, in, 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 with Gaza and, and the very limited impact of the United Nations, the post-COVID and the very limited, limited impact or role of the WHO, <laughs> we still are waiting for uh, statistics from China on what exactly happened in China with, uh, with COVID, but also the role of the WTO, which we don't know what it still means today. So it uh, has a... I mean, very limited impact, and we often say, look, in Europe, it's the Americans' fault, let's say, because they just refused to nominate these judges on the um, dispute settlement panel. But if I see um, then American discussions on the subject, and I remember a very good piece about this in the Wall Street Journal, which was at the end of the Trump administration by, um, what was again, the USTR under, under Trump, I forgot, uh, Lighthizer, which was saying, look, it's the Europeans which do not respect the WTO because they are concluding all forms of, double, of bilateral trade agreements. Europe has at the moment 47 different bilateral trade agreements. The US has one in the uh, uh, NAFTA agreement. And Lighthouse was very clear on that. Let's say this is not in line with what the WTO was designed to, to have basically the most favored nation clause. What Europe is doing is basically concluding all different forms of trade agreements with a multiplicity of countries around, uh, around the world. And if I then see, for example, a piece which Zambrovsky published about two months ago in the Financial Times, he was attacking basically all the time in that piece the United States, but hardly mentioning China. And I think personally, let's say if I look at it from a Brussels perspective, I think China is a much bigger problem for Europe than the United States is. But read that piece from Dombrovsky, which I think is only two months old, which was around the, when the, was, was the meeting in, the, in, in Abu Dhabi, I think, let's say, of the WTO, let's say one of these progress meetings. Um, and there you see the reflection that, I mean, Brussels is far too much still focused or obsessed by the United States. I think and should focus a bit more on China, and I think they don't know exactly what to do, which we, by the way, saw last week as well, let's say when uh, Xi was here. Uh, Xi is then visiting uh, Macron, and Macron is then inviting von der Leyen to have a discussion about, let's say, what is the relation between EU and China. But at the same time, Xi is visiting two very, yeah, rather peculiar countries in Europe, Serbia and Hungary. If I were to have been an EU delegate, I would have said, look, sorry, no meeting. If you're going to see uh, a country which is openly, or two countries which are openly challenging the EU, I'm mean, only to see us. On top of that, let's say, the fact that Xi was doing this is, is a kind of a big rebuff towards Europe to say, Europe, we don't care too much about you, we try to divide and rule. Um, so I found this very strange. So that about, let's say, these international institutions, which I think, let's say, they do not uh, mean too much at the moment. 
Then finally, de developments in Brussels. I mean, the good thing is what Nasha, Natasha said already, is that we now have a very strong focus on competitiveness and the single market. And I think that is extremely good. What Letta has done uh, with the single market report, but above all the fact that he's going around in Europe, he's gone to all the capitals, he's gone to plenty of conferences. He said, I've got something like 400 meetings before he published the report. I know he's going around everywhere to speak about the report. I think it's fantastic for this former Italian prime minister, let's say, to do this, to focus Europeans' mind to say, look, this is what we should have. And if we see after 30 years, there is still so much to be done. He identified these three key sectors, finance, energy, and digital, or telecoms and digital, as being the key sectors to be finalized. I think this is very courageous. But on the other hand, towards Europeans, they're saying, look, we have been de debating about this for 30 years, certainly finance, which we know very well. And how is it possible that there is still so much which remains to be done? On competitiveness, uh, there is a bit of a debate in Brussels which equals the competitiveness with deregulation. And that will be a big thing for the next commission, just to a bit constrain the debate. Look, competitiveness is not about reducing the rules, or um, having less rules will be, I think, extremely difficult. But that's a bit the perception which you have with the, um, certainly with the industry, with many industry associations. And I would refer you to a a uh, declaration which some of you may have seen in the Financial Times, a big page in the month of February, which was the Antwerp Declaration by the chemical industry, which was a picture where you had all the bosses of big chemical industries of Europe together with the Belgian Prime Minister, President of the uh, Council of Ministers, De Croo and van der Leyen, and then a declaration basically saying we need to have deregulation and at the same time keeping state aids, we need to be autonomous for energy, how they will do this and having interesting prices uh, to reindustrialize, I don't know. But they didn't mention anything about labor markets and how to reindustrialize with, without reopening uh, migration or having massive inflow of uh, cheap labor, certainly to reindustrialize uh, Europe. Which brings me to that debate about uh, strategic autonomy, on which we did, a, I think, an interesting study for the Economic and Social Committee in Brussels, where you basically say strategic autonomy is about a debate on industrial policy on which Europe hardly has the levers, because industrial policy is basically having the money f to inject in the economy to orient it in a certain direction, um, which is very difficult to, in fact, find what you need to do. But above all, it will create plenty of tensions in the single market, as we see already today. The countries which have most money to do it are Germany and France, which then undermine the coherence of the single market. On the trade agreements, already said, let's say this problem which we have with this bilateral, plenty of bilateral trade agreements which the EU has. Let me say finally something about the financial system. We discussed this yesterday, Thomas uh, and I, when we were in, in another conference uh, in the EUI in Florence. Um, the good thing is that there is no awareness, let's say, that in the context of the letter report, there is a big problem. CMU, capital markets, that we need to have a more competitive capital market is on everybody's mind. Let's say it's also mentioned by many, not only by people from governors, but also prime ministers, uh, head of state and government. Whether we will get there, I don't know. There is a bit of a expectation that we need to have a form of an SSM for capital markets, that we need to have a much stronger aligned regulatory system in capital markets a bit to the, uh, equal to what we have for banking, and that there is no regulatory arbitrage or kind of pick-and-choose attitude between regula I mean, regulatory authorities, or that one aut an authority uh, allows issuance of, for example, financial instruments, which are much less controlled than others, which then undermine the single financial market. Um, that's probably where I will end at the moment, and we can then come back to other points in the next session. Thanks very much. I think we're working towards uh, a set of very interesting uh, uh, questions for the second round. Mario? Thank you very much. Um, well, let me maybe come back to the um, headline of this uh, event today, end of neoliberalism. Now, I, we might not fully understand what the question really means and what the answer really is. I guess all of us, we have some sort of a feeling that there might be an end of a certain paradigm in the way we as a society in the West think about how economy, uh, how uh, our polities really work. And I think it has to do with an issue of a trade-off between efficiency versus security in the most broadest sense of the term security in all fields, basically, 
in the sense that we uh, have been overemphasizing in, in earlier periods the, the, the whole issue of efficiency very much and that we have um, probably neglected certain forms of, uh, of security from social security all the way to military security, security of um, the, our value chains and so on and so on. This in turn has led to uh, problems with the distribution uh, not only between individuals but I think uh, most importantly, regional distribution um, across time and space, basically. The whole idea about geography, all of a sudden, uh, the, the geographical space becoming an important issue that somehow we haven't been really discussing this in, in, in earlier years uh, a lot. I think this is an interesting um, uh, issue, and that leads us again to the third uh, point that all of uh, uh, economic uh, decision making has also political consequences, that uh, politics matters, that uh, the legitimacy of economic policy matters, and that in any case um, uh, it will have some sort of an economic effect, uh, maybe only a decade or two decades later, but nevertheless. Um, in this uh, respect, it's interesting to read work uh, and research around Professor Massimo Morelli from Bocconi University and, and his colleagues have been doing a lot of uh, both theoretical as well as uh, empirical research around the notion of trust. Uh, economists are, I think, fairly uncomfortable with trust and what it really means, but uh, I think he's very convincing in the sense that he gives an example that uh, societies uh, that, uh, like most of the Western societies, uh, um, uh, have experienced in recent decades a number of successive shocks with large parts of the society uh, not being really shielded from the effects of this shock. Um, trust in government and trust in the elites in general has um, uh, been eroding and as a consequence you have the rise of populism and that in turn uh, worsens further uh, economic policies and you, you are coming into a vicious circle and um, he claims that um, uh, for instance, uh, people apparently knew uh, that maybe uh, Mrs. Clinton would be the better candidate as a president with some good ideas uh, here and there maybe, or some bad ones as well, but nevertheless. Uh, and they knew probably that Trump is, uh, is maybe to a certain extent a charlatan, but the trust in Mrs. Clinton was uh, uh, close to zero, that she would uh, actually do anything about what she says and the trust in Mr. Trump apparently was much higher that at least the few things he, he claimed he will actually do that. Yeah. Now whether that happened or not is a different story but it's also for instance two weeks ago in the Financial Times uh, Joe Stiglitz was uh, basically mentioning that um, according to him, and that was the only time that I found neoliberalism in the Financial Times in recent months, uh, that neoliberalism is the, the cause of, of, of Trump in general. Now, whatever it really is, um, I think this political dimension is important and all politics is local uh, and we have experienced in Europe uh, similar trends, first in the periphery, in the south, in the east, in the northwest, and now it comes to the core of our continent. Uh, basically, um, the French and the German society are absorbed by these uh, uh, obvious local problems of a rise in populism. Um, and here, I think, is the, the really critical point. We, have, we are in the war, whether we like it or not. Uh, we, and I think being absorbed by these local political issues, we miss really the bigger security picture and here particularly in terms of energy security and uh, military security. Uh, and I think my uh, uh, suggestion would be that uh, um, let's be reminded of uh, an early stage of the European Union, the, 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 where it really everything started, the European community of coal and steel, they have basically been issuing uh, common joint bonds and they have been financing uh, joint projects. And this was all on a very small scale, but I think, um, why did we forget about this? Why don't we cooperate and try uh, to defend our security in these so crucial areas. It would be 
uh, one field to at least try a little bit of uh, something that others call industrial policy and that uh, unfortunately or fortunately they are fairly successful in, in performing that and if we will not be able to secure uh, energy uh, and our military security then uh, the, the, the outlook will be very bleak. Thanks very much. Uh, if we try to pull, the, pull this uh, uh, together, what, uh, what uh, you people have been saying, uh, it's essentially uh, within a north-south or west uh, non-democratic uh, or whatever uh, divide, uh, Europe uh, is faced with considerable handicaps. Uh, it is uh, intra alia uh, it has an incomplete internal market. That is why uh, countries with a significantly larger uh, uh, internal market, including a well-functioning capital market like the US, uh, amongst other things, have significant uh, competitive uh, advantages in uh, sort of future-oriented uh, sectors. If we uh, say we are living in an increasingly uh, divided uh, world, uh, which rules are the rules of the game? Uh, whose rules uh, will we be faced with? Uh, will we be faced with divided institutions, non-functioning institutions, one non-functioning institutions, two sets of functioning institutions? How do they communicate with each other? How will we trade uh, with each other in the future? Uh, if we don't have a certain element of mutual uh, understanding. Um, and that brings one then uh, to the question of uh, strategic sovereignty or autonomy, uh, which everybody is talking about. Uh, but faced with uh, American uh, industrial policy of a, of a huge nature, increasingly people in Europe are talking about a European uh, industrial policy. If this is indeed the case, A, how to finance it, B, uh, faced with other people's industrial policy, I refer to what Natasha was saying uh, in, indirectly, how do we, uh, in, uh, uh, amongst trading blocks, how do we make sure uh, that other people's measures don't undercut our competitive position, don't undercut uh, the well-functioning uh, of our economy? And that is exactly what the others will be saying about Europe. So are we uh, in for uh, an international trading system, which I still think uh, has served us well over the past 50, 60 years, are we in uh, for an international trading system which has no functioning global governance, no global set uh, of rules, let alone a set of rules that is mutually uh, acceptable uh, and accepted, and sort of rising border measures uh, which the Americans, the Europeans, and the others think are completely justified as long as they are their own measures because they have to protect themselves uh, from other people's uh, industrial uh, policies or distortive uh, measures, as, as the case may be. So, how, what what should Europe be doing in such, in such a world? Uh, what should we be doing? Uh, and everything hangs together. Uh, we have the issue of what is our position within the uh, UN? What is our uh, foreign policy clout? Do we have a foreign policy, a joint European foreign policy? Um, Laos was saying we should uh, enlarge the European Union, which is fine. Uh, as long as the internal functioning of the European Union gets better than it is today. Uh, and heavy conflicts, of course, uh, uh, divided opinions on that. So this is what I, th I think it's really drives me nuts nearly. Uh, how, how shall Europe not only survive but get stronger uh, if we are between a rock and a hard place? Is Europe between a rock and a hard place? Uh, are we, what can we do to get so hard that we don't get crushed? What can we contribute uh, so that a global system doesn't get more and more and more 
uh, divisive, whilst at the same time uh, respecting our need to uh, make, make our mark on uh, combating global warming, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, what should we do? Uh, maybe I turn uh, first to Natasha, uh, so as not to uh, overburden your electronic uh, uh, presence. Natasha. Thank you, Thomas. That, that's, a, that's not an easy question. Uh, I, I'll start maybe with, with a couple of points, uh, which also are bouncing back on, on some of the things that have been uh, that have been said. How can we be stronger from an economic point of view? How can we finance this industrial policy if it is desirable? How can we be more productive? It has been said that the productivity differential with the US is, is huge. And the answer to this is investment, investment, investment in education, in research, in innovation, the usual suspects, right? And one of the divides we have now is, uh, it's a paradox. It's not a contradiction, but a paradox. On the one hand, uh, there's not enough public money. I mean, there's public money in some cases, but not, not in others. And on aggregate, I'm not sure that's the right way to go, at least not certainly not in the place where I sit. Uh, too much debt around, public money badly spent, etc., etc. Now, there's a lot of private money that could be channeled to the right places and as those reports have shown and, and, and others those 300 billion euro worth of savings being sent mostly to the US to finance um, treasury bills they should be used somewhere else and th that's the meaning of putting back this capital market union agenda back at the center of what our, our, what our, our common project should be it may sound too technical and the proposals are very technical but at the end of the day that's the c'est le nerf de la guerre no so that's the first that's the first point a second point which is more difficult uh, it has to do with you know this idea of democratic values and i know here I don't know who said, I think it's you, Karel, you mentioned that, you know, the Chinese president came and, 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 and came to some not so bad places and then suddenly went to two bad places in, in Europe and we shouldn't. Um, it's very difficult. And, and, and I, I know we have in, in France, there are lots of discussions and there have been lots of discussions. Should we be so openly speaking with a superpower which has an ambiguous role in, in, in the current in, in, in all of the ma major current current mili military conflicts and that's not easy um, uh, there's no easy answer but i think let's not be too dogmatic as long as, as long as we are able to keep channels of uh, of information basically get the most information possible and i think that's this information asymmetry which is not helping us because we are always lagging in our in our response I'm not speaking about the US now, I'm speaking really about uh, about China. And and on, on on Europe, I would position what you said, Thomas, in, in, in the global context of Europe, in the context of the global south, which is itself evolving very fast. In the global south now, the BRICS, a lot of emerging markets have emerged in some dimensions, not all, but in some dimensions, and they have become big players, big financiers, uh, partly of, 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 of each other. The BRICS now include, you know, Iran and, and Saudi Arabia and, and, and all those places. And we have to see this reality. And, and that I, I come to, to what has been said as well in terms of being overrepresented in international institutions, we should face this as well. So it's a fact, it's a, it's a time of realism in our, uh, uh, in our standing in those international institutions so as to save their power, really. Uh, I hope nobody hears he, me here because they would be hated, but I think that's really where we need to, we, we, we need to, to, to work and to work intelli intelligently uh, together. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, maybe just a thought on uh, Global South, uh, et cetera. Uh, one, on the one hand, uh, we are in uh, need, I think, in Europe uh, of 
uh, expanding our alliances. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is a bit a contradiction if we uh, want to strengthen our alliances with sort of democratic market-oriented uh, economies. Uh, if we think uh, of India, for example, uh, if we think of uh, the Mercosur relationships, especially with Brazil, uh, it leaves us uh, with very good friendship with Liechtenstein, probably, at, 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 at the end. Uh, I turn maybe first to Karel, then to Mario, then to Lajos. On the question you, that remains your question? Inter alia, yes. <coughs> I think the uh, most important thing, consistency. If we say what we will do, we need to be consistent and we need to do it. And I think that was very clear in the letter report. I think it will also be clear in the Draghi report. Uh, it applies as well to the global order. So it, it applies to, let's say, what we do within the EU. I refer, for example, to infringement procedures, which is all the time going up. And the country which is uh, worst performer, by the way, is my country, Belgium, followed by Spain and then Portugal. I mean, but these statistics, if you see this, which are published by the Commission on an annual basis, are already striking. What Natasha said, invest in the future, invest in R&D, and, and Europe has increased in investment in R&D, but it remains 9.5% 9 9 of national investment, so if you see what is invested through horizon programs, it's only a fraction to what is invested at national level, which then leads to the question, let's say, how can you invest kind of in an efficient way if it's so uh, dispersed at, uh, at European level, so, or between the member states and the EU? We need to have more Europe, and I'm not negative. I think, let's say, where Europe has competences, it certainly has uh, advanced. But uh, one of the problems is Europe doesn't have competences in many different fields. Like think about labor markets, think about uh, health, which we've seen during the COVID crisis, think about defense, which uh, Natasha mentioned. I think it's rather flagrant at the moment, let's say, I mean, or position in uh, defense. I think uh, the way we support uh, Ukraine, I think we're somewhere at the limit. Uh, what we're doing, it's rather very bad, I think, for our position also internationally. And then finally, something about Global South. Uh, yes, I hear that. But we shouldn't forget that, and that's also related to the question which we have about uh, sanctions against Russia, that the dollar remains extremely dominant in international debt issuance, also for issuance of debt by uh, countries of the Global South. I saw the statistic recently, it's just on debt issuance, it's close to 90%, which is in dollars. And then, of course, Euro plays some role, but the rest is almost nothing. So, and there you see, let's say, the discrepancies we still have in the international financial system. We say, look, we need to have an international system with an international kind of issuance by many different countries, but there's basically on, only one country which matters is the dollar. Of course, the euro's participation in some other sectors is higher, but if you see simply debt issuance, you see how unequal our world still is and how much it benefits the United States. Thanks. Mario, maybe you could expand a little bit uh, on this question of uh, the, the need for industrial policy, uh, which I think you mentioned, uh, with, within Europe. Uh, we wrote a paper together uh, on, on, on this issue uh, on uh, the problems that countries in Central and Eastern Europe are uh, uh, experiencing in, in that regard. And how does that uh, place us in the international trading system then? Well, I mean, there is a... <laughs> there are parallel developments uh, everywhere where, where you look at um, I'm, I'm, I have family ties to Croatia, and um, it's interesting to see how in a very small territory, actually, you have pockets of modernity with uh, two unicorns, uh, where I hardly can even tell you what exactly these people are doing, but they are by now employing thousands of high-skilled employees, both in Croatia as well as all over the globe. And at the same time, just um, maybe 20 kilometers from from that uh, places, uh, you might have uh, villages without uh, connection to sewerage, uh, water, and some cases even maybe electricity. Yeah? And I think, uh, uh, as also Ivan Krastev likes to say, uh, in the central eastern European parts of uh, uh, our continent, we can see often things that uh, come actually first. It's not actually a world that is behind, but it's actually uh, often a world that is on the forefront uh, of certain uh, developments. And I think 
It is, it is uh, we have a very gifted population in, in, on our continent, a lot of uh, very high skilled uh, people, very innovative and so on. And what we obviously see is that once they develop some, uh, some business maybe also that is backed by, by a new invention, they have uh, huge troubles to actually find at some point the finance um, that uh, uh, is necessary to really bring it uh, up uh, and, and, and uh, in, uh, flying, basically. People then move to the states with their ideas. And, and so in that sense, we argued also for, uh, for really uh, a proper capital union fulfilling uh, this important uh, element in, 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 in this puzzle that we have here in Europe. Uh, and I think there is, there is, that's, that's absolutely clear. However, I might also say uh, that a deep capital market in the United States is not the whole story. If we look at the reason why uh, the so-called Silicon Valley is there where it is, it's not because it's such a beautiful desert there, you know. I, I mean, that was the area where the U.S. Navy installed their telegraphic system for the whole Pacific region and it created initial demand for a lot of private firms to chip in and the United States uh, military industrial complex is still financing a whole lot um, of, of uh, the high-tech industry that the United States still have. They have maybe given up on, 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 on old-school uh, manufacturing but in terms of high-skilled uh, high um, uh, working places in the high-tech industry they are obviously top and I think in that sense we can learn something. It's both uh, the capital markets but it's also uh, to a certain extent uh, something that we can call industrial policy, creating demand for certain uh, services and I fear, given the situation in which we are, and I, I'm not sure whether all politicians have still understood in what type of situation we are. We have a huge battlefield on European soil. We are at the, uh, so to speak, uh, fault lines of an evolving second co uh, cold uh, war. And uh, we have a lot of gray zones, uh, speaking about the Western Balkans, for instance, speaking about places like Moldova, Georgia, and so on in our vicinity and do we really want that we will uh, that we uh, experience additional battlefields with foreign powers meddling uh, here into into our system so i think uh, we also need uh, um, industrial policy maybe of a new type uh, i had the honor to serve as a, a dg grow fellow uh, last year and uh, all the fellows had to write an essay and uh, i called mine um, a catalytic industrial policy and it was an argument that we don't have any time to lose we have to basically target three uh, goals at the same time uh, it's both uh, uh, the, the the green transition goal it's the digital revolution goal uh, and it's also an area of um, democratic legitimation of all of these activities and we can't separate these uh, also in in territories uh, where we really want to invest, we have to think about uh, 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 also the distribution of uh, production facilities and so on. It's all part of one big story, uh, I think, that we have to, to face and, and it's a challenge. Thanks very much. Lars, pull it together. Mm. I can uh, more modestly share with you only my own views, but I will start with a very provocative statement, <clears throat> which is that the Western world, Western civilization doesn't need more differences, more internal fights and cleavages. That's why I respectfully disagree with uh, Monsieur le Président Macron, who wants strategic autonomy against the U.S. This is not what we need. We need strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. That's the real challenge for the world in the next uh, couple of decades. And um, I understand the view of the French president because there is a danger in November Trump may come back. So. It is just normal that European politicians, especially those who have a 
larger-than-life role in shaping the foreign policy of the European Union, <clears throat> want to have some kind of protective mechanism against it. But uh, if we put the whole thing into historical perspective, uh, populism has uh, ebbs and flows in the US as well as in Germany, in Austria, in Hungary, in many other places. So that's not where the major difference, the major, the most important global challenge lies. The most important global challenge lies uh, between the US and China, between the Western civilization and uh, the uh, state interventionist uh, dictatorships which do not respect uh, uh, human rights and democracy. That is the big challenge for this century, not Trump. So I think the responsibility of policymakers, and within that, the responsibility of economic policymakers is to offer alternatives, to come up with uh, alternative proposals which uh, can be implemented depending on how the global political environment uh, develops. Uh, of course, I'm not uh, uh, looking for uh, a conflict, let alone a war with China. Not, that's not what I want. But uh, when people talk about energy security and uh, defense, uh, they have to take it into consideration as one possible scenario of a major conflagration uh, globally. And uh, we have to implement economic policies which may help us in such a situation pretty much the same way as we changed EU level economic policy as well as member state level economic policies as a consequence of the Russian war in Ukraine. And we have been quite successful in a few areas, like for example making ourselves much less dependent on uh, Russian energy. And uh, I think we have to think about uh, the role of government in that context, what we should do if there is a further disintegration of uh, globalization, what we should do when uh, the multinational organizations uh, cannot be kept uh, as bastions or pillars of the rule-based international system. And in addition, how can we attract more of the global south so that they do not side with China and Russia, but rather they come to this, not only Liechtenstein, but also a few others, maybe Brazil and India and many others, which are, of course, not perfect places, but how can we say who is per perfect? I am a conservative liberal, so I don't like industrial policy. But I acknowledge that in such a situation, when there might be a disintegration of the global free trading system as such, there might be certain additional areas where governments should intervene. But I would put much higher emphasis on regulation rather than on government-driven investment. By the way, Europe has a great advantage. The propensity to save, the saving ratio in Europe is much higher than in the US. But savings are invested in a more efficient way in the United States. So why don't we increase our own competitiveness in such a way that we can use much more efficiently the biggest or the bigger and higher proportion of savings we have. And in that respect, what you said, not in the second round, but before, I think it was the capital market union. That's an absolutely key ingredient. In order for the private enterprise to be much more active, in bringing the whole European economy to the right direction where it can become more competitive and at the same time more secure. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, I had planned on uh, enabling Q and A uh, with uh, the audience. Uh, I see uh, under the watchful eye of Dietmar Schweizkut, I, I see that uh, time is uh, very, very short. Um, but maybe if I could invite three remarks, uh, not uh, lengthy exposés, but really three remarks on the central theme of uh, how uh, Europe can get, find its good place uh, in a drifting apart uh, world, both in terms of economics, institutions, etc. Uh, and then I'd uh, uh, not have another round because uh, we don't have the time for that, uh, but I would try and pull this together uh, and conclude. So uh, three remarks. I know exactly who will be the first one. Franz Nauschnick. I didn't see him. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one, one comment on Capital Markets Union. Uh, we are in the same situation which we were in the 80s when we had the so-called Eurosclerosis and the law uh, solved it by having uh, the internal, ma internal market. And now I think we, we have to uh, complete the internal market. And here Capital Markets Union is, is, is uh, in our view, the key element because it would allow the financing of uh, uh, green and digital transition with risk capital. And we have enough capital in Europe, but it's not invested in Europe. That's, that's our problem. And if we have a, a really good functioning capital markets union, which, which should uh, solve it. Uh, in ELEC, we delivered a paper for the commission because the commission told us the next commission will do a, an initiative in capital markets union. And so we, we delivered it. As, one as comment. did the last two commissions, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, uh, one, one comment also on uh, 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 industrial policy. Uh, here, I think we in Europe, we are more efficient than the US because for the green transition, we have not only subsidies, which the US does it under the su which subsidies, which is very costly, but we do it also with uh, uh, the ETS, with uh, uh, pricing of carbon. So if you combine this with two, it's much more efficient than only doing this, uh, it with subsidies. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, to oh. Natasha, one comment on the CBAM. The CBAM has already succeeded enormously because uh, I'm in the European Task Force Carbon Pricing. Uh, the Commission uh, four years ago told the told the Chinese, we are uh, preparing a CBAM and you have two options. Either you introduce a carbon price when you have an income or you pay the carbon border tax at the European uh, for your exports to Europe. The end result, the Chinese introduced the carbon uh, pricing system based on the European system in 22. Some, some would argue a necessary but not sufficient condition for a level playing field. Um, other comments? It appears that no further comments, questions, complaints, etc. If if not, then I will uh, just try and uh, make make a cup, couple of remarks. Um, Lars, you said uh, first first remark uh, that you, as a conservative liberal, uh, are against industrial policy, etc. Uh, but of course, uh, in international trade, we've got uh, the concept of countervailing duties against uh, foreign subsidies or market distortions or what have you not. So it's not only the question of what one wants uh, domestically, but how does one, uh, how does one deal with uh, issues arising from very significant industrial policies, not only in China, but in countries with which you want to have a, many others, uh, a considerably closer economic, political, uh, etc. Uh, alignment. So uh, we may be faced uh, with either uh, border measures or better understanding or measures of our own. Uh, and uh, all three of possibilities, of course, uh, have uh, uh, side effects which are, which are difficult uh, to, uh, to forecast. So if I 
try and condense uh, what we have heard that went in a slightly different direction than I, I had figured. Uh, but I, I would say uh, liberalism or neoliberalism, certain elements uh, thereof uh, are weaker or are fading, uh, at least at the global level, which some may deplore and others not. Uh, but uh, from what I've heard in the medium term, there is no uh, reversal in sight. So uh, what are the consequences? Uh, we live in a world uh, of increasingly fragmented uh, politics, uh, as I think all of you have made uh, the point. Fragmented politics lead to fragmented uh, economics. And that in turn means uh, that there is a significant danger of blocks uh, becoming internally more cohesive and these blocks drifting more uh, and more uh, apart. If that is not, uh, if that is the case, uh, then we more and more uh, are faced uh, with uh, a, with concerns of economic uh, rule break or economic dangers of rule breakers. Sometimes even within more uh, cohesive uh, groups uh, of countries, and that is then the question: How can we make uh, Europe stronger? And many. Uh, have pointed to the issue of competitiveness. Uh, we have, uh, what's it, 40 years uh, of the Single European Act, approximately, yeah. um, where we have uh, freedom of services, for example, enshrined already in the, in the treaty, and uh, there ain't no such thing. And uh, 40 years after the Single European Act, such people as Enrico Letta and many others uh, need to make the point that, enfin, we should finally liberalize uh, transport. Uh, we should uh, uh, have interconnectors between Spain and France uh, for energy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as, as Karel mentioned, uh, we're coming from the European University Institute uh, in Florence, where we had a long discussion uh, on capital market union. How can we get there? And it is totally clear. Uh, people will have, there will be winners and losers, um, and people simply will have to give up uh, their beloved world of segmented markets uh, where you can sort of trade off uh, against each, each other and keep the wee little Austrian uh, capital market segmented from the wee little uh, Slovak market and the maybe not quite so wee little uh, Dutch and, uh, and Belgian market. But for that, there needs to be uh, cognitive enlightenment uh, on politicians, uh, and that will only work uh, if you have a holistic uh, 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 program uh, of liberalization internally, which is a sine qua non if we want to uh, become again more competitive vis-a-vis -vis the non-European uh, world. It will imply uh, investment. It will imply uh, better public investment. Uh, there are differences of opinion here uh, on what role industrial uh, policy uh, should, uh, should be playing. Mario pointed uh, to certain uh, dangers of asymmetry between larger and smaller countries. He also pointed uh, to the interplay between uh, economics and politics and populism, which then feeds back uh, in a negative loop. Uh, to negative uh, economic uh, developments, in, in my view. And if we accept uh, su such a world, how can we construct it uh, that we will have border measures, not only of our own, but also of trading partners uh, that are not politically uh, uh, divisive, uh, but which uh, support our policy uh, ambitions on greening, uh, it's a, security, uh, et cetera. And all of that can only uh, be happening uh, in a world of stronger uh, than we have at present international dialogue, international uh, institutions. And again, also there, we will have to give up something. I've been part for bah, 30 years uh, of discussions on the European representation in international institutions. Uh, and it has I've, not changed. <laughs> I've, 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 in, in, in an abstract, in, in, in abstracto, uh, people are cognizant of the problem, but nobody what, wants to change. What, what do they want? They, 
Individuals want to be executive directors in the IMF. They love it, uh, and uh, you all know why. Yeah? <laughs> uh, uh, but what does it do for Belgium if it has an executive director, or for Austria, or for the Netherlands, or whatever? It's total nonsense. But that is how we are keeping out not only the South, uh, but the Brazilians, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, Natasha has a point. It will, it will, have, to, it will have to do uh, with Europeans, Austrians, Belgians, Hungarians, others, recognizing that you have to give up a few things uh, in order to win uh, uh, this uh, uh, hugely changed competitive environment in economics and politics uh, that we're faced with. Give up something to win something. Natasha will disagree with me. Natasha. You're, uh, we can see you talking but can't hear you, which is not very good. I'm afraid uh, this is a bit like the dialogue uh, bet <laughs> bet between, uh, between China and uh, Europe. Uh, I will continue this on a bilateral level, Natasha. We, we, we can talk about where, where we disagree. Anyway. Uh, Thank, thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, contributing uh, to a uh, lively and partial disagreement, uh, but also partial uh, agreement. Uh, let me also thank especially the Central Bank and its governor uh, for hosting uh, this discussion and uh, your introductory uh, remarks. And Dietmar, do you want to say something uh, uh, not in a personal capacity, but in institutional capacity, Dietmar. Uh, thank you very much. I'm not really uh, intending to hold you up much longer, especially because, Thomas, you already summarized the discussion uh, in an excellent way. Let me just say that on behalf of the Austrian French Center, I'm very happy to have this cooperation. I also would like to thank, of course, the governor for hosting this in the Austrian National Bank and also our partners, uh, the Vienna Institute for International Studies. Uh, very happy to have the CEU for the first time also as a partner. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Professor Bokros and of course, Karel, always a pleasure. Seps and uh, also Natasha, who unfortunately uh, was cut off by uh, technical issues. Uh, when, Thomas, we discussed for the first time this idea to have a seminar on this topic, it was already a while ago, and in the meantime, quite a lot of things have happened. And uh, uh, this was something which struck me when I looked again at the title, uh, the two question marks, the end of liberalism and the future of economic governance. It turned out that the discussion was much more about geopolitics. Uh, and when we talked about liberalism, it was very much in a, in a political sense, also pointing out that the difference is basically in what splits the world apart, which is maybe not so much the issue of what neoliberalism means or does not mean, but basically two different concepts of uh, governance in a wider sense. And um, this, I think, is, is interesting. I think, Thomas, you very much focused on uh, the role of Europe, what can we do basically in a, in a fractured world where economic governance or the, the famous rules-based system uh, is falling apart, or so it seems. Uh, what does it mean for the institutions? We didn't really focus too much on that. Um, what would be Europe's role basically in trying to salvage the international system or what would be Europe's idea, ideas for the for the institutions and the system of governance as such. Uh, the debate has much more focused basically on how can Europe defend itself in a position which is increasingly dominated by competition between the United States and China. I think there were interesting aspects also on the question of what does uh, strategic autonomy mean. 
Uh, I must say I'm, I have a lot of sympathy for your view, Professor Bokrus, because I, I think it, it means something to Europeans, but it's very dangerous to discuss it outside Europe because the Chinese just love it. They say, yes, you're all for it. You know, get, get away from the Americans. That's basically what they mean when they look at... And therefore, there is a danger, basically. Uh, I, I tend to disagree a bit with the fact that maybe Macron should not have received uh, Xi Jinping the way he did. I think it was much more regrettable that uh, an important member uh, of the European Union and a neighbor of France did not accept the invitation to join the meeting, showing that um, as long as you have a discrepancy of views between Germany and France, there's little chance for European unity. And that is also something which I think came out partially in the debate when you talked also about issues like strengthening the European competitive position, talking about capital market union. Basically, it all boils down to European unity and a sort of strategic sense forward. Uh, and that is something which we would like to, to continue. We said we would like to have a follow-up discussion uh, next time, not in Vienna, but in Paris, in the second half of the year, uh, focusing maybe on some of the issues uh, which were not discussed in, in great depth today, but which really deserve a follow-up. And by that time, maybe we can also focus a bit uh, on first reactions. There are already first reactions, but uh, a deeper reading, for instance, of the Mar Mario Draghi and letter reports, and to see to what extent the discussion at the political level in Brussels has moved on by that time. So once again, thank you very much, uh, and I wish you all a very pleasant evening.